Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Beatle News Briefs Extra. I'm Steve Marinucci, freelance writer on Billboard, Variety, and Goldmine, and moderator of the Facebook Beatle News and Information Group. And this edition is dated November 17, 2018. We'll have some Beatle news and a special extra segment with myself and contributing editor Candy Leonard, author of Beatleness, talking about another Beatles 50th anniversary. This one, the 50th anniversary today, November 17th, of George Harrison's surprise appearance on the Smothers Brothers show on November 17, 1968. We'll start our news with some chart news, and that's from officialcharts.com in the UK. And the album that's being highlighted here is the Beatles White Album, which of course just got released in a big deluxe set box with outtakes and, and a uh, 2018 uh, new mix. Um, on the uh, official charts uh, top 100 album chart, the Beatles White Album is number four. On its physical album chart, and album sales top 100, it's number three. And on its vinyl albums top 40, it's number two. Um, Brazilian media is reporting that Paul McCartney will be playing in South America in March to promote Egypt Station. Um, the concerts being rumored are in Argentina, Chile, and Brazil in March 2019. None of this, by the way, is confirmed as of yet. The four dates are uh, March 19th in Santiago, Chile at Estadio Nacional, March 22nd and 23rd in Buenos Aires, Argentina at Estadio Cuidad de la Plata, March 26th and 27th at Sao Paulo, Brazil at Alliance Park, and March 30th at Curitiba, Brazil at Estadio Cuoto Pereira. And again, none of this is confirmed. I should also mention that multiple Brazil uh, media is is uh, reporting this stuff. So, uh, next, uh, Ringo's recording engineer Bruce Sugar posted a picture on Facebook on Wednesday of himself with Joe Walsh and Ringo with the caption, "Great session today with two of my favorite rock and roll Hall of Famers." But we don't have any details on what the recording was for. The Beatles have been doing massive social media promotion for the White Album and Imagine sets with daily tweets, and there also have been videos of material such as interviews with Giles Martin and takes from the Imagine sessions that weren't included with either sets, which I, I really think was a, is kind of a mistake, especially the interviews with Giles talking about the album. I think it would have been great to have that stuff, but in any event. Um, John Bluthall, who played roles in both A Hard Day's Night and Help, like Victor Spinetti did, uh, has died at age 89. He played the anonymous car thief in A Hard Day's Night and Buddha in Help. He was best known as Frank Pickle in The Vicar of Dick Dibley. And if you're a baseball fan, you might want to check your um, your schedule of your baseball schedule. Um, the San Francisco Giants have released their special events schedule for next year, and I believe for the third year in a row they're going to have a Beatles tribute night, and I'm sure other baseball teams will do it too. So, um, We've been getting reports from people saying they've been having trouble uh, ordering the Wings 71 to 73 boxes, and they've asked us to, whether they're still available. Honestly, we don't know. We're guessing, however, that it's probably not available if it's not on the website any longer. So, But the separate boxes for Wildlife and uh, Red Rose Speedway are available on uh, Amazon. And it actually, if you go to our That's What I Want Beetle Store page on Facebook, we have links to order both of those boxes there. Um, Scylla Black has a new album just out in the UK called Scylla Black with the Royal Liverpool uh, Philharmonic Orchestra, and it has new orchestral arrangements of, of Scylla's songs, including McCartney's Step Inside Love and the McCartney-Lennon songs It's For You and Love of the Loved. You can find a link for that on our Facebook uh, Beatles News and Information page and also on the That's What I Want Beatles Store page. The Weaklings re- released a new single this week, Running Away on uh, on Friday. The song was recorded in Studio 2 at Abbey Road Studios and was written by Lefty and Zeke Weeklings. 
It features the saxes of former Ringo musical director and Billy Joel bandmate Mark Rivera. Our extra this week starts off our look back in history. On November 17, 1968, the Smothers Brothers began their show as they're usually, they usually do, but surprised their audience with a very special guest. Here is contributing editor Candy Leonard, author of Beatles, and myself talking about the 50th anniversary of George Harrison's surprise appearance on the Smothers Brothers show, which she thinks has a lot more significance than just a little walk-on. Here you go. I'm with Candy Leonard, um, author of Beatleness, and we're talking about the appearance of George Harrison on the Smothers Brothers show, which took place on November 17th, 1968, which it looks like another 50th anniversary. And Candy, actually, you wanted to talk about this because you think this appearance, which only lasted like three minutes long, and was actually introduced kind of kind of uh, very um, neatly by by the Smothers Brothers. Tommy also has a special guest uh, too and he'd like to introduce him right now. Wouldn't That's he? right, I have a beetle. <laughs> yeah, but it's not the kind of beetle you would expect it to be. It's the kind of beetle that you uh, I think you hoped it would be. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. George Harrison. By the way, Tommy Smothers says this is his favorite episode of all time. Of course it is. Yes. Well, not he didn't mention now he didn't mention George, but he they also had Dion uh, as in you know the singing uh, Abraham Martin and John. What, wasn't my man Donovan on that? Yes, one? Donovan. Donovan. Donovan was okay. on it too. Lila. Donovan was on it too. And Jennifer Warrens, who Jennifer was it? Who yeah. was uh, yeah. I believe she, that's um, the uh, woman who sang up. Where we belong with Joe mm-hmm. Cocker, but so that, that was a good episode, of right? The right. But sure. anyway, so Tommy Smother says this is his favorite episode. He said part of the reason is because the orchestra was on strike. They didn't have an. I guess they didn't have an orchestra that that night. So, in any, in, in any event, um, but you wanted to. You think this three minute appearance is a lot more significant than people seem to give it. I mean, I to be honest, I never. I thought it was cute, and I thought it was it was funny, but I never thought it was that significant. Why do you think it's that significant? Well, I think that it illustrates a moment where you see the Beatles acting as agents of change, right? Mm-hmm. Think about it this way, okay? So. Um, the prior two weeks on the Smothers Brothers, we had the Hey Jude and Revolution videos, right? Right. Which, which were quite revelatory. It was the first time we saw the hair parted in the middle, you know, everything about it. It was just visually, I mean, I'm not going to say it was as shocking as Strawberry Fields, perhaps, but, it, you know, it was, it was, they looked different. It was a very new iteration. And so it was very gripping, it was very exciting. And so, so you had one week of Hey Jude, one week of Revolution, and as with as I'm sure this experience probably resonates for you, you know, how you would always check the TV guide, right? What's <laughs> on, are any of the variety shows having any of my favorite bands, you know? So, of course, everybody knew that those videos were going to show, those films, as what, I don't know what we called them, but certainly we didn't call them videos, but we knew they were going to show, and of course that spread, everybody knew, and so, oh, and next week is going to be the other. So there was this habit of watching the Smothers Brothers, right? And so you're in the context of the Smothers Brothers, who were, were putting out very edgy political humor, um, they were really voices of the um, counterculture and left politics. And an- another thing which we can't get into now is this distinction that's always made between the politics and the counterculture. I think it's a false distinction, but that's for another. But the Smothers Brothers really captured both of those things. You know, they they were they were about the politics and they were also about have a little tea with Goldie, right? So so they were doing all of that. So the Beatles you know, are showcased in that context, right? And so everybody watching this, when I say I'm talking, you know, I mean, my focus is on the fan experience of this. And so these, you know, all these baby boomers are watching this. And 
present, you know, so the Beatles are in the midst of all of this. So, so they become political agents. And, you know, like I talk about in the book, it's like, the Beatles, you know, like fans trusted the Beatles, right? Mm-hmm. Everything about the Beatles was good, right? Good. They were fun. They were trustworthy. They were they were on our side, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so of course the Beatles would be on the side of good. So it's kind of a simple equation. Beatles equals good. Beatles equals counterculture. Counterculture equals good, you know? So for those young people who are watching what's happening in the culture at that moment, you know, the, the divide between the, you know, the hawks and the doves and, mm-hmm. and all that, you know, and, and it was breaking up families and, you know, it was it was a very big deal. Do you have something important? Or something very important to say on American television. You know, we don't, we, a lot of times we can't, we don't have opportunity saying anything important because it's American television. Every time you say something, <laughs> they try to say something important, they, uh, Cue the lines. <laughs> well, whether you can say it or not, keep trying to say it. That's what's important. You get that? Yeah. <laughs> that is very important. Cue, 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 cue. Ah, just a minute, just a minute. Just a minute. Wait a second. Okay. Cue the clap now. <laughs> anyway, so uh, so this is going on, and so even young fans who really maybe didn't, you know, were not following politics, maybe didn't even care so much about these things or didn't understand these issues, there was still the sense of like, where are you on this? What's going on? And you, you wanted to like somehow be involved in this big conversation. So so the Beatles basically told you which side to be on. Well, let's, let's set it up, go a little uh back a little further i mean let's go uh, kind of introduce it a little bit um i mean nobody knew he was going to be on that's right that's right see that but, but- and i think that's part of that's part of this because they did not at the beginning when they introduced the show the ge- the guest list did not include george harrison in fact the way they introduced george harrison you know uh, dick turned but, it over to tommy and he said right. We're going to have a Beatle on, and people started screaming like they thought it was going to be right. one of the Beatles. And then Tommy kind of said, "No, no, no, it's not that Beatle. It's the Beatle you'd, you know, you'd, you'd hoped it would be." And they and and then he introduced George Harrison, and the screams right. were like, you know, right. it was like they were they were at Dodger Stadium, you know. Right, right. Well, no, they, people, nobody knew they were that they were going to be on. But I think that the I think that. The you know again that's why the videos are important. In other words, you like you started watching the Smothers Brothers if you didn't. In other words, you were more tuned into them. You know, and of course mm-hmm. Donovan. You know, Donovan was kind of part of that. I mean, that whole show as we were talking about earlier. Who else? So it was Dion, Donovan, Jennifer. You know, like in other words, this was another venue to watch. You know, it was another variety show, but it was so steeped in politics right. that you know, in a way that. Um, Ed Sullivan obviously was not, but also the the uh, enter, you know the the acts and the you know everything about it was so much more edgy and political. Oh, as I say, even and the performers were also a little cooler than Sullivan was getting by that point, right? Right, and that was I mean that was one of the things that really distinguished the Smothers Brothers is that they had all these cool performers. I mean, even you know Sullivan had the Beatles too, but. Not that was, that was different. That was a different time, basically. I mean, that was that was you know what's so amazing when to think about, especially those of us who's, who lived through this. I mean, you think about you know the Beatles on with Smothers Brothers and Beatles with Ed Sullivan. These are not the same Beatles for sure, but it, it's really interesting to think about the ways in which they're not the same. Beatles. Well, he now now wait a minute because Sullivan did have. Um, right, he had the hello goodbye thing. He yeah, had hello goodbye. He had rain and paperback writer. But you know, I, I think that I don't know. It just feels different somehow. It just feels. Oh yeah, maybe there's no. The events of '68, the politics was becoming so much more on the front burner in the music. And oh, absolutely, because because, um, you know, because that was the whole deal with the Smothers Brothers. I mean, they were, they were. 
they were political. Um, so. Well, now we, yeah, I mean, this gets to the substance of why George was there, right? Because mm-hmm. he, if you think about it, why was he there? He was there to, um, the, the way I describe it, it's like he was there to sprinkle beetle dust on this mother's brothers, but also to uh, firmly, I, I mean, again, I'm not saying this was all in George's head, but what, but, but the, the, the result of it was that he, um, you know, this is the moment where the, where the Beatles really became agents of change and allied themselves with these comedians and this, in, in, in other words, they aligned them, they put themselves in that context of fighting the censors, of being out against the war, right. pushing its limits. That's, that, that's, uh, an, that's an excellent point because, yeah, they, at, up to up to that point, they had pretty much been, you know, they had gone along with the establishment. Not they hadn't completely, but I mean, this well, time they were they were they were they were going into the controversial, you know, into the controversial edgy area. Right. Well, that kind of started in '66. I mean, it was like this article that I just wrote where I talk about that the, the first two years, like '64 to '66, they're accruing authority, right, and trust. 60, then it, and then it shifts in the spring of 68 with the Jesus kerfuffle and the, uh, I think, Nowhere Man was very significant, too, in this regard. And then you have something different after that. You have them as this one author, Ian Inglis, talks about men of ideas, you know, that they become, they, were, they uh, did content analyses of their press conferences. And there was, in fact, I think Lewison did, might have done this, um, that the ratio of um, interview questions that were about the music versus about politics and issues of the day was shifted dramatically um, after that point. I mean, it was somewhat gradual, but shifted dramatically. So by the time you get to 68, you know, they're a whole different thing. And don't forget, too, the whole meditation business, uh, the, the India, which was very widely covered, um, it also added to their authority. So, so they were gradually, you know, so there was this early period of like accruing this authority and trust. And then in, in the 66 on, they're acting on this authority and trust. In other words, they are, they, they become political agents. Mm-hmm. But you think the Smothers Brothers appearance and George's surprise, you know, surprise showing up really was the kickoff for that. That it, it, well, it was the kickoff, but it was it was one of many things, you know, like um, with the uh, Strawberry Fields and Penny Lane videos, of course, the famous, you know, reaction. A lot of fans didn't like the look and blah, blah, blah. But um, as I talk about in Beatleness, the older fans, the ones who were maybe college age by then, were thrilled with that look because they interpreted it as the Beatles were on the side of student movement and and protest and all that even then and in other words they, they were they were hippies right and they mm-hmm. were um but again that this the false dichotomy of the you know hippies versus the political i think is ridiculous because they 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 really did embody both of those things so so even then they were seen as aligned with the counterculture but it did get more political as as the decade wore on because these well, these young Beatle fans were getting drafted, right? <laughs> at at a norm, you know, at incredibly high number, coming home in boxes. I mean, you know, so so, yeah. I mean, I these I have an anecdote in the book about you know this kid listening to Hey Jude, this group of friends listening to Hey Jude, sitting on a curb, and and somebody across the street, a, a military car pulls up, and you know, this family is told that their kid is dead, and this. Interview, he said. Every, I, every time I hear "Hey Jude," I think about that. So there was this political context that all of this was happening, and that was very fraught, and it was really touching the lives of people who were engaged with the Beatles. I think another thing too was the way the message came across in that short little, in that little three minutes. The way George kind of uh, it basically did a comedy, almost a comedy routine, but it was brilliant the way he he got the message out. You know, he. he um, oh, it was so George too. Keep trying. Don't give up. Right. Do what you need to do. Think for yourself. Right. And then yeah. and then cue the clap. I thought that was 
That was very cute. Yeah. That was that was definitely, you know, real George. That was definitely Plus he looked so beautiful. Here's where I <laughs> I can't. I can't say that. You can say that. Well, you can say, hey, you know what? I think that all you guy Beatle fans should just own up to the fact that you thought they were beautiful. <laughs> Nothing wrong with I'm that. I'm not going to. I'm not going to deny that uh, sitting on the floor in in February '64, watching watching them on TV. Uh, you know, I didn't wish that that was me they were screaming for. But uh, that's as far as you'll go. Okay, fine. Anyway. <laughs> He looked beautiful. He was wearing those green striped pants, which I think are the same striped pants he was wearing on their day out, although I can't swear to that, but those were also striped. So this wonderful ruffled, I have the picture in front of me, which is why I can describe it so Uh well. This beautiful ruffled orange coral colored shirt with this leather jacket. It's like a very androgynous look, or excuse me, the new phrasing is gender fluid. Mm -hmm. And, um, Although, as I'm looking now, he does have a Jagger-esque bulge in his pants. Uh, <laughs> it's just like a look, you know. He's got this look. He and also had his hair very long. I mean, it was his extreme. His hair was very long and a lovely shag. I mean, he just looked fuck. Excuse me. He looked, <laughs> he looked beautiful. He looked great, you know. Okay. And, and he looked so happy. And, you know, the other thing about this, too, is that, um, you know, John and Yoko at this point had already become kind of a side, you know, like an auxiliary spectacle mm-hmm. to the people. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, so they're off doing their thing. I and mean, so- it, we, do, we just passed the uh, 50th anniversary of the Two Virgins album. So Two Virgins took place before this. Like, so, right. but yeah. it's still in that same general, you know, mm-hmm. it's like late '68, right? But, I mean, they'd already John and Yoko had already broken the, you know, the nudity barrier and the contra- the, con- the controversy barrier, you know. So yes, yeah, you yeah, know, I mean, they were they there were some they were doing different things, you know, they were in the public eye separately, right, right, right. Um, so, so he, you know, so he, and so he, he, um, I forgot where we were going with this, some um, <laughs> point making about, I can't remember, but yeah, he, he, um, he, he, he was very, um, you know, he, he encompassed everything that the Beatles were at that moment in a lot of ways, you know, he mm-hmm. was, you know, by, 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 um, anointing the Smothers Brothers, it was kind of a mutual anointment. It was like they aligned themselves, you know, um, in that way. And, if, and and the fact, again, I think it's significant. To, I mean, what what part of what makes this significant? Uh, this little cameo is that the the videos in the previous two weeks. I think had that not been the case, it, I think it would be would not have been. I don't think it would have been as significant. But you know, you don't, I think, you don't really don't think so because I think I think the appearance for the charm. Yeah, the charm of the appearance would have would have been would have made it significant anyway. It might have even made but it I, even more. It might have even made it more significant because people had not just seen them for the previous two weeks on on the show. It yeah, would have been a bigger surprise. I mean, it would have been like, maybe. But I think that I think that part of it is that. Those two weeks, you know, how we, we talked about before about how you would check your TV guide, right? right? And so I think that I think that I, I don't know this to be true. <laughs> like Bill Maher says, I don't know it, but I know it's true. Is right. that I suspect that more Beatle fans started watching the Smothers Brothers. Oh, I'm That's sure. Like, I'm sure they did. They, exactly. They, they, so I think that those two weeks were kind of a. It primed the pump. I guess I would put it maybe that way. For That's, the I, I would. I would agree with you with that. I would agree. I would agree there. Yeah. That's absolutely true. Because you know what it was like. We were looking all over the TV guide for like who's going to be on. You know. Mm-hmm. The, and the sm- the smothers but, it was going to be on, but I, like, but we knew about the Beatles the two weeks before, right? And they were, and the Smothers Brothers were already hip, but obviously having George made them a lot hipper. Oh yes, it was a mutual. I mean, they 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 both there was a synergy. You know, what I mean, there, there was a synergy that that the the Beatles became political agents. They be, the Smothers Brothers became hipper and cooler, and everybody was happy. <laughs> <laughs> and they lived happily ever after and except, ushered the age of Aquarius. Except maybe CBS, which was never happy with them at that point. But, right. But that's, 
that's another that's another story. There's a whole book on that. That uh, yeah, I think that George, in his quiet little way, really, um, you know, I'm, John and Yoko are out there doing all the peace stuff and whatnot. But but George really, um, I think, was very instrumental in his quiet way in um, really. Um, imparting a certain sensibility, a certain consciousness in 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 people, you know, in, in listeners and fans, you know, that maybe he's not given full credit for. And I'll tell you when I that when I was listening to Sour Milk Sea, I was thinking about that again. I think that you know, like you know, John was the one out there comparing himself to Christ, but like George was a preacher, like he was, you know, that he was, a, or I should say, a preacher too. You know what I mean? Like they both were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Very politically charged moment, you know, in the culture. You know, it, it, I mean, it's really. I think it's a moment that really, um, where you see how the music and the politics really come together. You know, people talk about that in relation to the '60s all the time. You know, musical. But this is a moment where you can, and of course, media. You know, TV, and you know, you can really see this. Um, well, to use the word synergy again, but this how you know, these musicians and, you know, that, and the, of the Beatles stature. Well, as Tommy said, they were the biggest thing in the world. That's mm-hmm. the thing. They were the biggest thing in the world. And, I mean, and, of course, since the beginning. But at that point, you know, they were like, they were bigger in a, in a, in a new way, you know. And, and you know, I don't, in, in thinking about the other three, I'm not sure that, I mean, Paul is you know, is generally a good quote unquote actor in terms of, you know, being personable and that kind of thing. I'm not mm-hmm. sure he could have done as good a job as George did. That was just a brilliant stroke of what, you know, of, of the way George handled himself. Right. That well, night. I don't think it was in Paul. I don't think Paul would have had the will. I don't think he would have want. I mean, it, it doesn't strike me as a Paul move in any way. But maybe not. I don't know. I mean, I it's, don't know. It, yeah. It, I mean, it's hard to go back <laughs> to in that point and and say. Um, the only reason why I think maybe it could have been was because Paul was a little uh, into you know avant garde and kind of the art. He he did have an arts corner in his personality. Right. So it's very it's it's possible, but I don't know that he could have done it. Like I said, I don't think he could have done it as well as George did. Yeah, he, he was taking out the ad in the in the IT for the legalized pot and all that stuff they mm-hmm. did. He was involved with that, right, Paul? It's funny that those two, uh, 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 that moment with the Smothers Brothers, and the other big acting, or no, I shouldn't say acting moment, but showbiz moment that you kind of remember George for was the, the scene in the the office in A Hard Day's Night were just too, yeah. too brilliant. Yeah. I mean, he really, he I, he never gets enough credit for that kind of thing. Well, yeah. I, I think I've said this publicly. I'll say it again. He's, I, I mean, I, I mean, John is in his own category for me, but George, if somebody asks me like my favorite Beatle, at this point, I think I'm up to George. I've gone, I've gone now on all of them. Seriously, I mean, I, I think he's maybe it's because I'm getting older and becoming more spiritual in my old age and mm-hmm. appreciating him more seriously. I mean, that could be part of it. But I feel like his contributions. Um, I, I don't know about musically. I wouldn't necess- but certainly on, at the phenomenon level. Okay, I think that George does not really get his due. No, I, I I agree with you, and I I do think musically, I think you know even Beatle wise and and later, you know his his there's some there's some great stuff there. But it, <clears throat> I mean, we could go through the Beatle stuff, you know, moment by moment and talk about how you know how he was. But yeah, he he was just and and, and he was fantastic. And then I mean, spiritually, what he did for the world with. Ravi Shankar and you know oh. and and, medi- and and actually kind of I mean I think the the meditation thing was was in large part due to him you know um well, you know, let's that, that too back a little more you know Patty had a role in that as well which she never gets credit for she if I if I'm remembering correctly and and again maybe there are different accounts of this and who really knows but as I as I understand it 
she brought home the flyer that that he was going to be at the London Hilton and suggested that they all go. Here's a last minute addition for a cool free event coming up in Burbank, California. The Raz Band with Joey Mall and the Badfinger will be recording a live album at 8 p.m. December 8th at Center Staging Studios at 3407 Winona Avenue in Burbank. Um, the evening will feature songs from their upcoming album, Number 9, as well as classic Raz Band songs from The Best of Raz, Madison Park, and some surprise tunes. All ages are welcome. Seating is limited. You can get tickets at the Raz Band at gmail.com. That's the Raz, R-A-Z, band at gmail.com. Continuing our look back into history, uh, on November 18, 1967, Melody Maker reported the Beatles would be releasing music from Magical Mystery Tour in a special EP set in the UK in both mono and stereo. Press officer Tony Barrow said the Beatles were eager, eager to keep the cost of the whole production under a pound, and EMI co- cooperated with this. Happy birthday on November 17th to Gene Clark of the Birds, and also to yours truly. In 1973, Ringo Starr's Ringo album debuted on the charts in the U.S. It got as high as number two. Thanks for listening. You can hear the show in rotation in Back to Back Blocks on Fab Four Radio. And you can also catch the individual shows on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts. Send your comments to BeetleNewsDesk at gmail.com or leave them on YouTube. On Facebook, join our Beatles News and Information Group, and please take a look at our That's What I Want Beatles store. And we would also please ask you to subscribe to the show wherever you get it. Thanks to Candy Leonard for the discussion about the Smothers Brothers, and thanks to you for listening. Until next time, this is Steve Marinucci saying, what else? You say it's your birthday? Well, it's my birthday too, yeah. Keep that one. Market fab.